At this time, I'd like to call to order the July meeting with the Kenny Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, normally, we have uh, Donald Babs, our chaplain. You uh, provide our invitation. He is not with us, but would you please stand? Almighty God, as we we gather this evening. Please bless this chapter of the Sons of America Revolution as our purpose is to promote sound learning and true patriotism and to further all that is good in our community. We pray that you will strengthen our hands in all that we undertake that we may serve our nation to your honor, to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Also, if you'll please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance flag and act six. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Also, uh, Peter Ford, are you here? Sir, we lead us in the pledge to the Texas flag. Honor about the Texas flag. And I pledge allegiance to the Texas One of the God, one in the individual. And our Secretary of Law, Jeremy, has the uh, SCR pledge. We said that as the year goes, sacrifices that I was the United States of America. Well, please be seated. We got a great crowd for July. I thought we got about maybe five people here because it's so hot. So thank you all for coming. Uh, this time we'll have our self introductions. Okay, you'll take her. Good evening, chapter right here. Good evening, I'm Nick McClellan, and I live here in the county. All right, I'm Terry Akers, this is my wife, Sandy, and we have a plan on for the Dent chapter and the McKinney chapter. Lord Brandon, the one who joined the McKinney chapter. Paul Andreessen, I'm a member in the McKinney chapter, and I brought along a friend, Patty Jones. Here's her right here in the Here's Uber, that's when you back. Bill Watts, Dallas chapter. Copy of Boston, Dallas chapter in the McKinney. P.L. Holden, Sherman. Ray Harvey, I'm over at Lancaster Stadium. I'm the band of Carol in, in uh, Sherwood and McKinney Channel. Ed Wilson, me, Edmund, Carol, and Sherman. You'll be very McKinney. John Greer, uh, Evan, Carol, McKinney, and Dallas. And I am the site mini chairman for the flag committee. We need to give a flag certificate for this chapter. Bart Morgan and my wife Sammy. Uh, we live in Anna, and my application is in to the state. Uh, Ellison McKean. Was he the secretary? With Mike Smith. Jerry mm -hmm. McKean, McKean chapter. Board of Treasurer, Mr. Chapter. Kevin Ennis, also Mr. Chapter. Sorry, more. Application is in for the Dallas Director. Nathan White, my wife Wanda, past president of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, my name is John Dangle. I guess it gets to be last. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, now for our program and our historical moment, Tom. <clears throat> Has everybody got an agenda? Anyone down here? Oh, yeah. I don't think one for Steve. I'll put yours just up here on the podium. Okay. Another? Oh, hey. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, First of all, we'll go with the historical moment. Hi, on your, by the way, on Greer. Send me another historical, send me another historical moment. Okay. Okay, so, you know, we are still in the month of July. And uh, I don't know, I saw this on Facebook. I think uh, Mel Waller, who's the state secretary, posted that, and posted this. And, Here we go. And, and, uh, Got me to thinking again about you know the sacrifices that our forefathers made, and so I thought I didn't even know for the July was a few weeks ago. But I, I think it's worth us remembering. By signing the Declaration of Independence, the 56 Americans pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. <clears throat> it was no idle pledge. Nine signers died of wounds during the Revolutionary War. Five were captured or imprisoned. Wives and children were killed, jailed, mistreated, or left penniless. Twelve signers' uh, houses were burned to the ground. Seventeen lost everything they owned. No signer defected. Well, I've heard something that maybe one of them did, I think, but this is like a tombstone marker says that no signer defected. Uh, their honor, like their nation, remained intact. So, again, that sort of, uh, in my mind, tells the story of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tonight we've got uh, Stephen, oh, I said Drieger, right? Yep. Okay, Stephen Drieger. Uh, Stephen, uh, we, he uh, was here earlier in the year, and he uh, basically uh, is going to continue with the second half of this uh, program. Uh, uh, he's a professor emeritus in geography. His degrees are in uh, geography at the University of Virginia with a BA at uh, Northwestern University with an MS and uh, University of Georgia with a PhD. He taught for over 40 years at the uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, except for a year in Spain as a Fulbright senior researcher and a year in Mexico as a visiting professor. While at the uh, uh, UMKC, he uh, served as chairman of the Geosciences Department, as director of the university's urban studies program, as president of the Kansas City chapter of Sigma Psi, which is an honorary research, uh, scientific research uh, society, and the president of, of uh, let's see, president of the University of Missouri, Kansas City's chapter of uh, the Honor uh, Society Phi Kappa Phi. Five Kappa Five. He has presented over 60 times. You do all that stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> just a long time. I was just about to that. He presented over 60, presented, uh, over 60 conference papers, published uh, over 80 articles and two books. Okay. Um, um, for the Plano chapter of SAR, he serves as secretary in 2021 and as the president in 2022. He has six ancestors who fought in the American Revolution. And then on top of everything else, Steve, Steve, Steve was a Marine. He served on active duty from 1970 to 1973 and in active reserves from 1973 to 1976. Mm -hmm. His military occupation specialty was artillery and his final rank uh, was captain. First, thank you for being here. It's appreciate it. Now I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you. Well, the last time I was here, there was a big forecast for hail. <laughs> and that side of the restaurant moving with damage my car and for a handful of people here. So yeah. I'm glad the weather cooperated in the sense that a lot of you can turn out today. So I will talk uh, about the geography of the American Revolution part two. 
from Valley Forge to Yorktown. So from December 1777 to June 1778, the British, as we know, occupied Philadelphia, but the French Open Alliance, now with the Americans, put Britain on the defense. Now, something a lot of people haven't heard much about is the Carlisle Commission. Britain sent the Carlisle Commission to Philadelphia in June to try to negotiate a settlement to the war. And it's interesting because of these terms that were offered by the Carlisle Commission had been made, let's say, in 1774 before Lexington and Concord. I think the American colonies would have said, that's wonderful. We're getting everything we want. We'll continue to be part of the British Empire. But by June of 1778, it was too late. What did the Brits offer them? Oh, things like, oh, you don't have to pay any taxes after all, except for imports and exports. And you'll have a representation in the British Parliament, et cetera, et cetera. They really made them full-fledged members of the empire and actually gave them a big tax break, but it was too late. The negotiators for the United States then said, no thanks, uh, we reject this. And then, well, the Carlisle Commission, they got upset and said, okay, you're gonna be subject then to devastation and destruction. All right. Now, by spring, the Continental Army exhibited a new professionalism at Valley Forge largely due to Major General Baron von Steuben, a very colorful character that we were very lucky he came over to the United States. He had served on the general staff of uh, Frederick the Great as a captain. And for some reason, there's controversy over exactly what happened, but he was fired from the general staff and couldn't find another position in any European army. So, you know, some serious charges were made against him, at least one I know of anonymously. But it was enough to ruin his career in Europe. So he had a friend in France say, you know what, Franklin's over here now in, in Paris, and uh, why don't you come here and talk to Franklin and see if he can put in a good word for you with Washington and the Continental Congress, and uh, maybe you can uh, join the Continental Army. And so... He went and talked to Franklin. Franklin was impressed with him. And Franklin said, you know what? We're going to make you lieutenant general <laughs> because the Continental Congress had already told Franklin over in Europe, don't send us any more brigadier generals or major generals from Europe. So Franklin promotes him to a lieutenant general, <laughs> sends him, gives him money to come to the United States. He meets with Washington. Washington is impressed with him. He was a big, bulky figure fluent in German and French, knew a little bit of English, particularly swear words, and he was very instrumental in organizing the Continental Army at Valley Forge. He created a blue book, which was used all the way, I think, up until the Civil War for army drills and for how to handle your arms and things like this. And here in this uh, inset picture in the middle, you can see him training the Continental Army had to load their muskets and fire them quickly at it, broken down into a 15-step process. That if you're really, really proficient, you could do this in 20 seconds. So you could actually get off three rounds in a minute. Pretty good. On the right there, we see the cabins that were built by the Continental Army at Valley Forge. The house, some 13,000 soldiers, and I think there were a couple thousand more camp followers on top of that. It became the fourth largest city in the United States at that time after Boston, Philadelphia, well, Philadelphia was the largest, then Boston, then New York, then Valley Forge actually comes in as the fourth largest city, even though it's it's temporary. And Von Steuben helped with this too. He improved the sanitation there, told them how to build latrines, make them far enough away from the cabins and downhill from them to fill up the latrines every four days and build new ones, et cetera, et cetera. So he was really instrumental with his knowledge in shaping up the American forces. So Washington, buoyed by the transformation of the Continental Army into a disciplined force by von Steuben, is eager to bring the fight back to the British. And he has the chance to do this 
at the Battle of Monmouth on June 28, 1778. Clinton, Sir Henry Clinton and his forces leave uh, Philadelphia in, in June uh, on their way back to New York City. Now, most of the people uh, just had to march back there, but he sent the Hessians and the Loyalists on ships to New York City, thinking that they might not bear the uh, hardship of marching all the way to New York City. And on June 23rd, Clinton Russian Society the American militia men at Bordentown showed there at number four. And the same day, Washington arrives at Hopewell, New Jersey, shown at number five, and holds a war council. And this was standard operating procedure for Washington during the Revolutionary War. Every time they might go into battle, he hold a war council mm -hmm. with the senior officers and get their opinions and get their support if they were going to fight. And at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, Major General Charles Lee was at point seven there in English town with orders to attack the rear guard of the retreating uh, Clinton going back to New York City. But Lee failed to form a clear plan of attack and I think panicked somewhat when the rear guard fought back with him and uh, his troops were in disarray. And Washington saw this and was extremely upset. And uh, he was a man of a tight control of his emotions, but he got mad at this point and really cursed out Lee and uh, said, you know, we ought to court martial you at least he said, you know what, that's great. You court martial me. So they did. And, and uh, this was the end of Lee. Basically, he had to withdraw from the Continental Army uh, for at least a year after this uh, court martial because he was found guilty. Now, the Battle of Monmouth itself is, uh, in many people's minds, very important because a heroine emerges here called Molly Pitcher, who supposedly was Mary Ludwig Hayes who brought water to the men in the afternoon conflict. And when her husband was slain, she supposedly took over the post with the cannon that was part of the Pennsylvania artillery and uh, did a good job and was later made an NCO by Washington. So we have a painting on the left, and actually a print by Curl and Eyes. It's probably a little more accurate depiction of her <laughs> than in 1856. And then a painting by Don Troiani, my favorite military artist from Connecticut, uh, painted in 2004. Troiani's paintings are quite good because he actually uses models for the key figures. So he's really able to capture uh, the emotions in his, in his paintings. And he has a Facebook page that you can sign up for. And he tells a lot of prints. He probably did artwork for you on your mission, but I don't know how expensive that would be very at this point because he has thousands of followers. Now, Molly Hayes is real, but the story is probably a myth. But some 7,000 women did accompany the American troops as nurses, cooks, laundresses, uh, as basically quasi nurses caring for the sick, etc. And uh, at least a couple of documented uh, women. Uh, fought in the revolution. Margaret Corbin, so-called Captain Molly, uh, fought, and also Deborah Sampson Gannett, uh, under the name Deborah Sampson Gannett's her married name. And uh, she actually uh, assumed the name of a man named Robert Shirtleff, the only one I know that pretended she was a man uh, during the conflict and supposedly was very good at uh, cursing and so on and fit right in with all the other troops. Now, both these women were awarded pensions, but to my knowledge, uh, Deborah Sampson Gannett was the only one awarded a full pension as a bona fide continental soldier. And when she died, uh, starting around 1830, when they allowed uh, general vets to get pensions, uh, her husband, as a widower, was able to receive full military pension for the rest of his life. <clears throat> Now, Newport is the next big scene of action after New Jersey. Uh, Vice Admiral Comte de Stang arrives off the Delaware Capes, that's southern Delaware, with 12 ships of the line. Those are the most powerful warships, and they were superior to the nine ships of the line 
that British Admiral Richard Howe, who was then in New York Harbor. Washington wanted a joint land attack with Vice Admiral Destan against the Brits in New York City. But Destan tries to enter the harbors of New York there in the Lower Hudson River crossing Sandy Hook and the bar was too much. He couldn't risk grounding his boats on the bar, so he gave up that idea. And then he and Washington agreed to a joint operation in Newport, which was a bad constellation prize, because at this point, Newport was the fourth largest city among the rebellious colonies after Philadelphia, Boston, New York, then comes Newport. So the French fleet was supposed to attack from the west, shown there at number two, and the American forces from the east, shown at number one. But the French fleet leaves pursuing Admiral Howe's fleet that comes up and pursue uh, this thing uh, to uh, Newport. And so once the French vacate, this kind of ruins the plans of the Americans to try to take uh, capture Newport. And uh, after the American militiamen leave, the American forces try to engage the British at three, four, and five there to the north of uh, Rhode Island or Adpening Island, as it's also called. But then they have to retreat back to Friberton at one after the British get uh, reinforced. So that was a failure for the Patriots. Now, morale goes down then with this major failure. So Washington's looking for a way to boost morale, just like he did with Trent and Princeton before going into Valley Forge. So he looks to Stony Point as a possible place where the Americans can obtain a victory. Washington is sitting with his forces on the west side of the Hudson River, and to lure Washington engagement, Clinton ceases Stony Point, shown there at number one, out of a little Gibraltar, if you will, uh, separated by a, a neck of land that's kind of marshy and high tide, even underwater, uh, with a, a main part of New York there. This was a key location because it's just by King's Ferry which is a southernmost connection between New York and the New England uh, colonies. So the Americans figure, okay, let's try to take a Stony Point and do it in a novel way with a three-pronged attack uh, with the force in the middle uh, kind of making the noise and allowed to fire their muskets. But the two lines of attack there on the uh, north and south of the position were supposed to be silent and only use their bandits in charging the position. And uh, it was successful enough that the Brits abandoned their position to relocate forces to the American South. And then soon after this, they decide the Americans do to let's try to take Paulus Hook the same way we did Stony Point, as shown there in the inset map to the South. And uh, they attacked it, as you can see, in the same way, a three-pronged attack, uh, the center prong being able to fire, the two flank prongs being uh, told to attack it quietly, and they were able to take it. Now, they abandoned both positions soon after taking them, but that didn't matter. The victory of the British raised the morale of the patriots, so it's very important. Now, the next big scene of action here is on the war on the frontier, done in 1778 to 1779, by Colonel George Rogers Clark of the Virginia Militia. And this was one of the most successful operations in all of the Revolutionary War. He sets out from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and goes all the way south there into uh, Kaskaskia, shown at number five, and then up little bit to the northwest to Cahokia at six, and then going back northeast to Vincennes there at seven. And he's able to capture uh, these places. And he actually captures Vincennes twice, because after he captures it, uh, the British moved down from Fort Detroit there, shown at one, and uh, recaptured Vincennes, but uh, George Rogers Clark takes it away from them again. So that's very successful. And that's very, very important because it, it secures Great Lakes area, the upper Mississippi area uh, for the 
patriots for the duration of the Revolutionary War. Then over to the east on the frontier, we have Major General John Sullivan's expedition against the powerful Iroquois nation in revenge for the British and Indian destruction of Wyoming Valley, shown there at number eight, where present-day Wilkes Bar is uh, located. And uh, this really upset Washington, and so he gave General John Sullivan instructions. I, I want the Indians wiped out, destroy their villages, eliminate their opposition once and for all. So Sullivan led 4,400 men from June to November 1779, destroyed over 40 Indian villages and their food supplies, burning their cornfields, destroying their orchards, leaving nothing intact in their villages. The only pitch battle that the Indians raged, waged, excuse me, in response was at Newton there, number nine, and the Patriots won that. But in some ways, it was a pirate victory because uh, this didn't eliminate the threat of the Iroquois uh, during the Revolutionary War. It simply drove them further into the arms of the, of the British. Now, the revolution moves to the south as the British decide to abandon Philadelphia in June of 1778, as we mentioned. And they decide that, you know what, we need to better supply operations in the Caribbean and Florida. The Caribbean was very important because the islands there economically were worth much more than the American colonies or, or Canada, frankly, to the British and, and the French because of sugar. And uh, Florida was important because, well, it was there as kind of gateway between the Caribbean and the North American colonies. The British troops sent south to Florida uh, were used upon the initiative of the person in charge of that expedition to capture Savannah. He wasn't supposed to do this, but he decided to do it anyway, and he captures it in 1778. In response, Destang, Admiral Destang, arrives in Savannah from the Caribbean in September of 1779 and combines forces with Major General Benjamin Lincoln to try to retake Savannah. On October 9th, a coup de main, in other words, a big surprise attack, was conducted against the Spring Hill Redoubt, shown there at number three. And in the work there, the attack on Savannah by Augustus Ignatius Keller uh, was to portray this attack on the Spring Hill Redoubt. And uh, it was launched at dawn, despite an overwhelming new Miracle advantage because the deserter had alerted the British that the Americans were going to do this at dawn. Uh, the attack failed because the British put their very best fighters at the Spring Hill Redoubt and they were able to fight off the attack. And the losses for the Patriots were devastating. Uh, the importance of this was that it convinced the British of their sagacity and the so called Southern strategy to win the war. They assume this is the place where we can get a foothold more easily because there are more loyalists here. About maybe up to slightly less than a half of the population here could be considered loyalists, which was a larger percentage than you would have found in the middle colonies and especially in New England. So it was not the uh, dumbest strategy. Now, and the British really had no choice but to move the war south because the opposition in the parliament was already beginning to argue that the war was a failure, it was too expensive, it was sapping British security, which at that time, the Brits had just about every significant country in the world as an enemy because they had been too successful in a sense in the Seven Years' War, or what we call the French and Indian War, because they created such a large empire in response to that, all the significant countries in Europe now considered Britain too powerful and were trying to form alliances against it. And then Britain was concerned about that. So in response, the colonial secretary, Lord Germain, counters that American loyalists should not be abandoned and that they can help win the war, provided that they're just trained properly and provided with British leadership. But the social geography of the South was a little more complicated than the British realized. Basically, you can divide the South into basically three 
what we call physiographic provinces. You've got the, the coastal plain, which in Virginia and most of North Carolina we call the tidewater. Then when you get down to South Carolina and Georgia, it's called the low country, but it's all one and the same physiographic unit. That area was dominated by planters and sea traders, and they were supportive of the rebellion. The Piedmont, the rolling hills inland from the tidewater and the low country, uh, separated by the um, trying to think of the fall line, uh, where the rivers kind of go over a period of rapids before they slowly drain over the coastal plain area. Uh, this area between the fall line and the Appalachian Hills uh, was dominated by Scotch Irish farmers who resented the planters and the traders of the coast, so they tended to be loyalists. Then you got to the third physiographic area, the Appalachian uh, hills and valleys and ridges, and that was dominated by frontiersmen, or what we sometimes call over the mountain men, and they were very enthusiastic patriots uh, because they didn't like the British because the British supported the Indians there. They also didn't like the British because the British were trying to prevent them from moving further west. And even if they didn't want to move further west, they knew that some of their children would have to if they were to have their own farms. So next, the big action shows up in Charleston in the spring of 1780 as British General Henry Clinton tries to recapture Charleston first via the sea in 1776, uh, but fails as he is basically over in this area here and is not able to pay for it military, so it has to abandon that attempt. But he can't get it off his mind. So in December 26, 1779, he again sails from New York City with 14 warships and 8,500 soldiers and 90 transports, a pretty big flotilla. And uh, after appearance of Annis Harbor, the fleet lands in Odesto Inlet, kind of over here to the west of this uh, Blue Arrow. And uh, there at the uh, inlet, uh, they land on February 11th. Now Charleston, knowing this is going on, builds defensive fortifications at four, they're just up the uh, peninsula from the city. And the Americans also sink some ships to form a log and chain boom to try to prevent the British fleet from moving up the uh, two rivers there, as you can see, to the east of Charleston. Well, Clinton, Clinton crosses the Ashley River at number seven with 10,000 troops as he gets some reinforcements and sets up siege lines at eight there, just north of the American fortifications at four. And after the Fort Moultrie surrenders this time to British Marines, the Americans and Brits on May 9th fire cannonades at each other. And it's the civilian leaders in Charleston that beg American General Benjamin Lincoln here to spare their city by surrendering. And I think of the People in Charleston had their choice. They would have uh, had their city be an open city or a neutral city, uh, but the Brits wouldn't agree to that. Uh, so they had to surrender. And all 5,500 American fighters surrendered. This is the worst US defeat in the revolution. And I think one of the worst surrenders up until the time in World War II in the Philippines. Now, <clears throat> The action moves to the Carolina Piedmont in the summer of 1780. The effective government in the back country of the Carolinas collapses after the British capture of Charleston. And Clinton declares the amnesty to rebels will be given only to those who help secure His Majesty's government. That probably wasn't a smart idea because that left the people with little choice. They either had to help His Majesty's government or they had to show their cards and support the revolution. And Clinton then leaves uh, for New York and puts Cornwallis in command as the Carolinians are choosing up sides. Now, Cornwallis was an interesting choice. He looks something like a professor. And he'd look at him and go, oh, you know, how is this guy going to be an effective general? But he was probably the best British general during the American Revolution. He would make detailed claims 
plans, excuse me, is very courageous and a good commander in delegating things to his senior officers. Now, the summer melee begins at Waxhaw, there's one uh, where Lieutenant Colonel Benastre Tarleton's Loyalist Dragoons, Florida Colonel Abraham Buford's Virginia Continentals. And the photo over there on the right, I took at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia uh, last summer. And it kind of shows, kind of gives you an idea of what it's like being attacked by one of these dragoons that sort of flailing away with their sabers, hacking away at your hands and arms and face. Uh, it uh, really wasn't something you wanted to see coming at you, so they were very effective at getting people to surrender or run away. Now, the summer partisan fighting in Piedmont ended at Hanging Rock 6, where the North and South Carolina mission, militias finally defeat the Loyalists and a British garrison and kill or wound 40% of the Loyalists, and that was the bloodiest of the battles in the South. The action then moves to Camden, South Carolina, in uh, shown there, I believe it be. And after the surrender of Charleston, the nearest Continental regiments are out there at A, in Hillsborough, North Carolina, under Major General Baron DeKalb. But Congress isn't satisfied with him being in charge of the war effort in the South and decides to appoint Horatio Gates, without consulting Washington, by the way, to be the hero of Sarah who was considered the hero of Saratoga to be in charge. But there's a lot of debate about how heroic he was in Saratoga. Much of the credit should go to his senior officers, especially Benny McDonald. The Count's forces are not large and they lack food. The Count wants to take an indirect route to Camden to collect food and supplies, but Gates decides, no, we've got to direct, directly march there and attack the British at point B. And uh, this was a stupid decision because going from A to B, you're going through pine barrens, and there wasn't much to forage there for the troops. Uh, so they were very hungry by the time they got to Camden and B. And Cornwallis decides to leave C there and march with his reinforcements to Camden and pursue Gates Ford forces just north of Camden. Despite a two to one advantage, the Americans are defeated defeated because they're weary, they're in bad shape, and they're hungry. And the militiamen on the left flank flee. And uh, that's a big mistake that uh, Gates made by putting all militiamen on one flank. And the Cal on the right flank fought valiantly, but he was mortally wounded. And of course, then his forces go in disarray. So the survivors in two regiments of Continentals had no choice but to this surrender. And Gates, as this is going on, flees on horseback back to Hillsborough, I believe via Charlotte, and a three and a half day trip over about 180 miles. And uh, I think it was Alexander Hamilton that summed this up pretty well, saying, uh, there is no other instance in history of a general uh, leaving his own forces so precipitously, and uh, there is no other instance of such a precipitous ride in retreat in history. And this left Gates disgraced, but no formal charges were brought against him, but it basically pretty much finishes his role in the American Revolution. Now we move to Kings Mountain. Why? Because Cornwallis wants to move north, uh, pressing the back into North Carolina and eventually Virginia. So after defeating Gates' army at Camden, Cornwallis sets out in his attempt to conquer North Carolina, marches his army first to Charlotte, going there at one over there on, on, the, on the right. And uh, Ferguson uh, leads 1,000 loyalists, South Carolina and North Carolina militiamen, and up to 100 New York and New Jersey volunteers from the British Legion to Gilbert Town, too. Ferguson is basically uh, a major under Cornwallis, and he's supposed to secure the left flank uh, for uh, Cornwallis. Uh, but the frontiersmen find out about this, they decide they're going to teach Ferguson a lesson because Ferguson was kind of bragging that, oh, I'm gonna lay this country waste to, to sword and fire. There's gonna be nothing left of it, and I'll teach these six a lesson. So the Patriots uh, 
find out that Ferguson has kind of moved back toward Charlotte, but decided to set up a defensive position on King's map to get ready to fight with them. So they decide to cleverly surround King's Mountain, which is kind of shaped like the sole of a boot. And uh, so they have an eight column pronged attack, four on the west side of King's Mountain, four on the east side of King's Mountain. And they attack uphill, whooping like Indians. And Ferguson's men are told to charge downhill with their bayonets and uh, do as much destruction as they can, and only then once at the bottom to maybe uh, uh, detach their bayonets and fire their, their muskets, and then they're supposed to climb back uphill. Uh, but while they're climbing back uphill, of course, they're going to be shot at uh, by the Patriots, many of whom have rifles, mm -hmm. and the big difference there is the rifles literally rifled in the inside of the barrel. So the shooting's more accurate over much longer range, two to 300 yards, versus maybe 130 yards or so for the muskets. Uh, so they were able in the end to kill, capture, or execute all of Ferguson's men. And he is killed and buried in the vicinity of King's Mountain by a spring. So that was a huge victory. Any of you have any ancestors from King's Mountain? Yeah, there's usually a bunch here in Texas. For yeah. some reason. That's interesting. So that was big. And here's a, a painting of King's Mountain done by Don Troyani again. And no doubt the figures in the foreground are based on models and then maybe in the background not so. Uh, the horsemen at Redcoats uh, are the loyalist uh, regulars and Ferguson's loyalist foot soldiers were again the militiamen from North Carolina and South Carolina. And the Patriot mounted men there are shown uh, in their buckskin and shirts and so on. And uh, they're coming in from both sides of the Blue Ridge Mountain. And the stunning Patriot victory, so stunning because it was done without any Continental soldiers whatsoever. So this, I think, really scared the loyalists in the Carolina backcountry in Piedmont to lay low in their resistance. And it certainly buoyed the spirits of, of the Patriots leading to a string of subsequent victories. Now, Cowpens is the next big conflict, also in South Carolina. After Ferguson's defeated Kings Mountain, Cornwallis has to pull back to South Carolina, and the Coward Gates is replaced as head of the Southern Army by Major General Nathaniel Green, second Navy in ability only to General Washington himself. Green splits his force, contrary to all recommendations, between Brigadier General Daniel Morgan, who had a contingent of 600 men go west, and the other men and Green's force went to the southeast to Cheron, South Carolina, in search of supplies. You're never supposed to split your force if, if you're opposed to a superior force, but in this case, it worked out very well for Green. Cornwallis sends Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton, the dreaded Tarleton, with 1,100 men after Daniel Morgan, who acquires more men to count in South Carolina to equal Tarleton. So this is probably a good place to take a stand. Cowpens refers to the fact that this was a common cow pasturage, so it would have been well known to the frontiersmen who probably would have brought their cattle there for free pasture. So they knew where to come to rally in this battle. And Morgan wins the battle through innovative tactics. So the first line of defense there that won, which was set up as kind of a picket line of some of the best shooters, some of the best shooters made snipers, told to pick off particularly the officers in um, uh, the force of uh, uh, Tarleton, who's, who's attacking. And then when they get too close, they're supposed to retreat. And then the next line of defense is two, which is made up of militiamen. And they're supposed to get off two or three volleys. And when it's getting too close for comfort for them, then they're supposed to retreat. And then the Continentals are lined up there at three. So this was an innovative tactic at that time. And it, and it worked very well because what happens is 
uh, they're able to stop the main force of advance here in the center. And then, of course, the dragoons here on either side, the loyalist dragoons, uh, with some of the Brits. And uh, here they're repulsed by William Washington's dragoons. We believe William Washington was a distant relative of uh, General Washington, but I'm not sure that's been established genealogically. But William Washington surprises Carrollton's forces here, so they have to kind of retreat in shock. Then Carrollton later moves over here and tries to press the attack this way, but getting his force back by the forces now regrouping among the Americans and attacking British advance over in that direction. So all, almost all the British forces here are killed, wounded, or captured. Sheraton's British Legion is wrecked, and his reputation as the butcher or, or bloody band, as he was sometimes called, kind of gets destroyed, and he's no longer feared like he was before. From Cowpens, the action moves to the Guilford Courthouse as both forces are moving northward expecting the final action there somewhere in Virginia. So Morgan retreats north through North Carolina, and he's pursued by a furious Cornwallis who's determined to free Morgan's British prisoners. And Cornwallis, ever the detailed planner, decides he needs to move so fast, he even burns the supply wagons so he can move fast enough to try to catch Morgan. But Morgan's forces meet up with Green's forces on February 8th at Guilford Courthouse at A, and in the Council of War, all the American officers vote against turning to fight Cornwallis. So instead, they have to retreat north of the Dan River, which kind of separates North Carolina and Virginia. And uh, there they're safe because Cornwallis didn't have boats to ferry him across the uh, Dan River into Virginia. So in early March, Green picks up a thousand more militia and 550 Continentals for a total of 4,400 and decides to go back to Guilford Courthouse to try to confront Cornwallis there. So at Guilford Courthouse, we have the big battle on March 15, 1781. Morgan has retired due to ill health. He suffered both from rheumatism and I think he contracted malaria, a serious problem at that time in the United States, which is beginning to make a comeback now with global warming. And uh, Green, however, learned from his tactics and borrowed them. So the North Carolina militiamen now form the first line of defense there, shown in one. So we have the, the British attacking over in this direction. So here's the first line of defense here. And then at two, we have in the woods, uh, Virginia militiamen as a second line of defense. And then the Continentals again are put as the big final line of defense in line three there to the right. They're atop a hill behind another open field. And part of the American left flank is turned by the Brit charge. But the other part, the Maryland First Regiment, attacks the Brit flank while Colonel Washington's cavalry strikes them from the rear. And that's what's pictured here in the painting, again by Don Triani in the battle Guilford Courthouse. Now, despite the smaller force, the British suffered twice as many dead and injured as the Americans. But after Cornwallis fires grape shot into the melee by loading grape shot into a cannon, Green decides that it's not worth getting his troops mauled by the grape shot and decides to retreat north due to a gap in his lines of defense. But this was a, while it wasn't a, a tactical victory for the Americans, it was a strategic victory for sure. And Charles James Fox, a Whig a parliamentarian in England, uh, one of the main opposition figures to King George III, is quoted as saying, and no such victory would ruin the British army. And uh, so this, again, uh, empowers the opposition here in Great Britain to try to put an end to this war. So the next big conflict is at Utah Springs, South Carolina in September 8, 1781. In midsummer, Green takes his men to the high hills of Santee to rest for six weeks. The so-called high hills of Santee are, I think I showed them before, 
somewhere on here. There they are in blue here. That's the high hills of the Santee. They're only about 200 feet above sea level, but it was enough to get away from the swamps, maybe in some of the mosquitoes of the low country of South Carolina and offer a halfway decent place for the men to rest. So on August 22nd, Great Moose's army north to Camden crosses the Watery River and heads southeast for British Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Stewart's camp at Utah Springs, which is maybe 50, 60 miles to the northwest of uh, Charleston. Both sides had about an equal number of troops, 2,000. And the, uh, they would have had a surprise attack in this case, because again, the loyalists at this point are kind of acting more low key, so they're not as many spies, but they had a work party out trying to harvest yams, and they spotted uh, Green's forces, and so they gave the alarm, and Stuart then was allowed to position some of his forces then uh, just in, in front of the camp here and, and one to try to defend it. So Green places the North Carolina and South Carolina men, militiamen in the front line at two, and then when the militia breaks, he sends forth the North Carolina Continentals who are at three, and then after that, when they break, Green sends forward the Virginia and Maryland Continentals, who were veterans of the Guilford uh, Courthouse battle, and uh, they overrun the Brits. But unfortunately, they stop to loot the camp because the Brits have to quickly leave the camp for all these tents with food in them, liquor in them, et cetera, and the troops just couldn't resist this. And this disarray in looting the camp gave the Brits a chance to reconstitute and drive off the Patriots there shown at number six. So this is one of the bloodiest conflicts of the revolution, which technically ends as a tactical victory for the Brits as they're able to drive off the Patriots. But again, it's a strategic victory for the Patriots at after this, Stuart considers his position untenable and he withdraws his forces to Charleston. Mm -hmm. So at this point, in the fall of 1781, the only place the Brits control in the South are Savannah, Charleston, and Wilmington. Now, the action finally moves up to Virginia in the spring and summer of 1781. Cornwallis becomes convinced that Virginia is the key to victory because it's central position between the North and South Patriot armies and its waterways. So he figures that he can control Virginia, he'll disrupt any communication between North and South, and then they won't have enough strength to kick the British out. Clinton, at Cornwallis's request, sends troops to Fort Smith down there at one, all the way in the lower right. And uh, they loot and burn the farms and homes there at Portsmouth. And the British Brigadier General Benedict Arnold, uh, ready for revenge against the Americans uh, because uh, he wasn't promoted properly. So he feels that uh, uh, he got screwed. So he, he's going to get his revenge. And he sails up the James River there to burn Richmond, shown in point A. And Washington sends Lafayette and his small army to Virginia, and um, but at the same time, the Brits are moving up the James River to try to loot Petersburg, and Lafayette is able, I believe, to protect Petersburg from looting and burning, but outnumbered, Lafayette uh, has to retreat and sends his supplies out to Point of Forks over there in the west at number six, and he moves with the the rest of his army uh, back east and a little bit to the north at Ely's Ford, shown there at point to the seven. And after reinforcements, finally at eight, Lafayette is able to move south again to occupy Williamsburg and uh, after a skirmish. And then he sends a small contention to attack Cornwallis's supposed rear guard, uh, but this fails. Cornwallis is now at Fort Smith at one. And he gets ready to send 3,000 troops back to New York City. But Clinton countermands that order and directs Cornwallis to hold a deep water seaport 
for the British fleet. And that's how Cornwallis ends up at Yorktown. So it really wasn't his fault or his stupidity. It was a deep water port that was available to him on orders of Clinton. So Washington and the French fleet converge on Virginia starting the late summer and early fall of 1781. For two years, Washington with the Northern Army has basically been camped out in the Hudson River Highlands, doing little more than skirmishing with the British. On April of 1781, he writes to Congress, quote, we are at the end of our tether, unquote. The big problem being his troops weren't being paid, weren't being properly clothed, weren't oftentimes being fed. They were often being paid in continental dollars, which were almost worthless. But in May, French Admiral de Grasse plans to move the French fleet north from the Caribbean to American waters, and Washington and Rochambeau, commander of the French garrison Newport, plan an attack on New York City. But they had to abandon the plan because they probe all, all the defensive British lines around New York City and could not find a single weak spot to attack. And learning that the grass set sail in August for the Chesapeake Bay, Washington decides to join Lafayette in Williamsburg, shown there at number two. And the British in dark about Washington's march south until he's in Philadelphia on September 2nd, just before the British Admiral Hood moves his Caribbean fleet from the Chesapeake to New York City. It's a very interesting story. The British know that de Grasse has left the Caribbean, but they're not sure where he's going to. They figure it's either to the Chesapeake or to New York, okay? But, but what happened is while they're trailing de Grasse, and so they should have been able to see where he would lay anchor, de Grasse instead takes a detour to Havana to get supplies and food for the soldiers on his ship and the sailors. The British didn't know this because they were too far behind him. So when the British Admiral gets up to the Chesapeake, he looks around and goes, oh, the grass isn't here. There are no French ships here, so he must be up in New York. So he sails to New York, and then the grass later on comes to the Chesapeake unopposed and is able to drop anchor there on August 30th, shown there at point five. And uh, by Chester, Washington learns that the grass has uh, laid anchor there and has arrived also with 2,500 soldiers. And this is probably the most excited Washington got during the whole Revolutionary War. He uh, is so excited because he knows Cornwallis is trapped. And when Rochambeau uh, joins forces with him, at, I think it's Gloucester there at number six in, in Pennsylvania, uh, he actually hugs uh, Rochambeau. He's dancing around on the dock there. Uh, waving his hat around, he's so excited. Nobody's seen Washington this emotional before or probably since. And uh, it's, it's because he knew that this this might be it. Because both sides were really looking for a dramatic end of the war at this point. They were both getting very tired of it. So the British Admiral Hood, with his fleet, reaches New York City, urges Admiral Samuel Graves there, the commander-in-chief of the North American fleet, to set sail for the Chesapeake, as they realize, as, oops, they're not here in New York, they must be in the Chesapeake. So they go back to the Chesapeake with 19 ships of the line, but they're opposed now by the French, who have 35 ships of the line. And of course, they're in the best position there. And so when Grace fleet sails back uh, and, and confronts them, uh, they're, they're really not able to do much. Only the ships that are closest together Come there in the painting there by a guy named V. Zeg, who was a naval art historian. I haven't been able to find out much about him. Not only the ships in the very front there, so close to each other, are really able to reach each other uh, with, their, with their cannons. So Graves decides to go back to New York City uh, to get more reinforcements. But the problem for him is by the time they leave New York City again, the Chesapeake. Cornwallis, he's already surrendered. And uh, so this naval battle, while it was not really decisive, is the most strategic naval battle of the entire war. So the Siege of Yorktown, September 28th to October 19th, 1781, 
<clears throat> By this time, the Americans and the Brits are very tired of work looking for a knockout blow, and the grass, like, as we discussed, is in the fleet, is in the Chesapeake Bay with its fleet. And uh, after the last soldiers from New York reached Williamsburg, the American army, now 16,500 strong, sets out for Yorktown on September 28th, and they set up at, at position one there on the uh, south of the of the map there and uh, try to lay siege. And the uh, French set up a position two there to the west, also laying siege. And uh, some uh, forces are detached, both French and American forces up here to Gloucester Point, and they're to keep Bannister Carlston penned up here so he can't break out from there and reinforce uh, Cornwallis. Now, the Allies dig a parallel, number five, moving much closer to Yorktown so they can lay better siege uh, to uh, Yorktown. Basically, this is an artillery duel. It's what Yorktown basically amounts to. You have cannon, howitzers, and mortars on both sides firing at each other. We all know what a cannon is. The mortars are short tube uh, weapons uh, meant to hurl bombs, literally much higher in the air that come down and, and hit you from above. And the howitzers were kind of a, a cross between a cannon and a mortar, short tube, like a mortar but mounted on a chassis like a cannon so they could fire kind of directly horizontally like a cannon or, or with a small arc and also way up in the air uh, like a mortar if so desired. <clears throat> Now, being uh, attacked by this artillery was no fun. I read a statistic that for eight days, on, on average, about one of these cannonballs or mortar bombs was landing on Cornwallis's fortunes in Yorktown 24 hours a day for eight days. So for people whose arms were, be kept, were cut off, legs lost, heads decapitated, from this barrage. It really surprised Cornwallis the force with which the French and the Americans could bring to bear with their artillery. So Cornwallis, uh, waiting for reinforcements, decides that uh, eventually he's, he's got to try to break out of this somehow, uh, particularly as, as the patriots move, move closer and uh, they, they put up siege lines there at six and seven by taking readouts nine and ten. The French attacked Redoubt 9 there at number 7. The Americans under, I believe it was Captain Alexander Hamilton, uh, take uh, Redoubt number 10, shown there at 8. This allows them to get their guns even that much more effective on the, on the British. So Cornwallis has no choice now to try to break out somehow. So he tries to first break out with uh, boats going to Gloucester Point. And he got about a thousand men out to Gloucester Point, but then a big storm came in and scattered the boats so he couldn't evacuate any more troops from uh, Yorktown. So he has thousands of troops left there. So his only other choice is to try to break somewhere out through the lines of the American and, and the French. But he's not able to do this. They try a big breakout shown there at nine. Uh, as you can see, and, and they're only able to spike a total of six uh, cannons. That's, that's nothing because uh, the uh, Allies had about 155 pieces of artillery. So spiking six of them, which involves putting either a, a steel spike through the uh, a borehole or in a cannon, they call it a vent hole, in a cannon, I think they call it the blow hole. You can put a spike through there that's barbed, so it's very hard to get out and you can't fire the cannon, or failing that, you can just stick your bayonet in there and break the bayonet off, and that can also serve the similar purpose. So you know, that's a failure. So what, what do they do? They have to surrender. On October 17th, a British drummer beats Barley, and a British officer waves a white hanky at the end of his sword, and a formal surrender takes place two days later on the 19th. Over 7,400 British and Hessians made prisoners of war or are missing. So this is by far the biggest defeat for the British of, of the war. So the Allied victory at Yorktown finishes any British hope 
of winning the war. They simply have too few, too few troops left. They couldn't defeat the New Englanders. They couldn't defeat the colonies and, and the middle colonies. They failed in the South here after a bloody conflict of two years in the South. And uh, so they, they know the, the gig's up. And when news of the British defeat reaches London, Prime Minister Lord North comments, oh God, it's all over, it's all over. And uh, his regime is all over as of early March 1782. And almost immediately afterwards, Parliament authorizes the government to make peace uh, with America. Now, peace really isn't arranged, of course, for about a year and a half later until 1783. A lot of people seem to forget that. And there are some battles and skirmishes after Yorktown, but the course of the war had been decided that some very important people are, are killed after this uh, battle of uh, Yorktown. And many of the Continental soldiers aren't dismissed until April of 1783 from their service, when it's really clear that, that their services are no longer needed. Now, how did we treat the vets afterwards? Well, probably not very well, but I'm not sure the Continental Congress was in any position to treat them very well. Most of the vets faced poverty because many of them were wounded in this uh, long battle, weren't as able as before. If they were so disabled, they would get a pension as early as 1789. But indigenous soldiers, the poor soldiers, had no pension until 1818. And for other common soldiers, they had no pension until 1832, and then they had a crew. They were in service for at least six months. And widows weren't eligible for a veteran's pension until 1836. And in these paintings here, this again is done trying to the north. George Washington firing the first shot here by lighting the blowhole of that particular cannon. And uh, this is uh, the attack here on Redoubt 10, uh, where the Americans are attacking the British. And uh, were successful, and this is the surrender of the British Army there. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No? No? Okay. Thank you. Hold on a minute. Okay. The one I gave you last time. Frank uh, is just time for you. So, oh. There you go. So, anyway, this is just one just like the other one I gave you. And basically, for part two, like I said, I'm saying we always. A little, do a little better each time. Well, yeah. yeah. So I got to get the frame in. Thank you so much. Okay, if we're going to take your ear for using my phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. 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 Thank you, okay. very much. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. 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 In this room, could attend some of the conferences. We we had a few years ago. We had one in Winston Salem, North Carolina. Then we had one in Savannah, Georgia, and then we had one in South Carolina. All of the things that Stephen talked about this evening, have, we visited those places while we were attending Congress, and uh, this year. One of the one of the things that we attended, one of the places we attended uh, in conjunction with the Congress in Orlando was the last naval battle uh, in the in that vicinity. 
Well, I've got some big news from Congress. I'm going to tell you about it in a minute, but I'm going to tell you a few other things first. First of all, we had a smaller delegation from Texas than normal. Uh, don't know why, uh, but uh, it was in Orlando. And I want to tell you that there is, you know, several for several years, people have been saying, well, all this education is great, great but uh, there's a big wide world out here other than just Louisville. And we need this, we need this information and we need all these educational opportunities out in the field. Now, I want you to go to the website uh, and check the members section and then education because there are resources that are really great. And I, I hope, frankly, that we'll be able to have the education director, Ray Ann Sauer, from Louisville, uh, maybe on a Zoom one of these times, walking us through all of the things that are now available for chapters throughout the country. And uh, I think it would make a great program to have her do that. It takes about 20, 25 minutes for her to walk through, but it'll give everyone a, a real insight into the, the resources that are being developed in Louisville. Next year, the Congress is going to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I have no doubt that we'll get over to Valley Forge. And uh, once again, some of the sites that Stephen talked about tonight are going to be available to us. Last night's speaker, the Tuesday night speaker, was a very interesting speaker. Like Stephen, it was tonight. He gave a he gave a talk about the the viewpoint of the revolution from the British side. He's not a Brit, but he he gave that. That's the way he approached it. Now I want to see how you, how often how much everybody was listening. Why? Well, how, first of all, how many colonies did Britain have? On this continent, on this, yes, and this uh, hemisphere. How many? See, we look at it as 13 and perhaps 14, but they're really what, 26 from Nova Scotia all right on down to the Bahamas. They looked at it completely different. We all think 13 colonies, and it all was uh, uh, Georgia, all upward. To, to what is now Maine. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Roger Smith was a speaker. He wrote a book, a little pamphlet here, called The 14th Colony. And what would that have been? Somebody said 14. What would that have been? The books in uh, Nova Scotia. No, no, no. Florida. 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 East, East Florida. But Stephen uh, mentioned something. Uh, you, you can almost, you can almost do that. The wars have always been fought over economies, commodities, and so forth. Why were the Brits moving? He, he said the, the British moved their troops from Philadelphia down to the Caribbean. Why would they have done that? Money. Somebody made, he mentioned it. Sugar. Sugar was going, they were more interested in sugar than they were in flax and tea and all the rest of the other commodities that were taking place in the colony. Sugar was the real goal, and they had made up deals with Spain over Havana, which was really the hot spot for sugar. They, they talked about. Why was Mexico involved? Why, why did we, uh, why were they we trying to get to Mexico to Cuba? <laughs> <laughs> we were having trouble financing the revolution, and what did they have in, uh, in Mexico? Um, our gold, gold and silver. But, but you see, they looked at things differently than right. we look at it. And that was uh, that made a very interesting uh, uh, bookend of what we what we heard tonight. What we heard tonight were the various battles as we marched toward Yorktown. The British were looking at it from they moved their troops down into the Bahamas. We, you know, you, we think, my gosh, why were they doing that? The battle was 
the battle was between Georgia and New York, but not necessarily from their people. Anyway, it was a very interesting Tuesday night, and I hope maybe we'll be able to, I don't know whether uh, Dr. Roger Smith was speaker, I don't know whether he, he's going to be available perhaps by Zoom, and maybe we can get him at the Texas State Conference, State meeting uh, in San Antonio next year, um, and I hope maybe many of you can attend that. It turns out, I <laughs> I attended more congresses than anybody else was at the Congress. It's 28 consecutive congresses, starting starting in uh, uh, starting in San Antonio in 1996. All right, what's the big news? The big news is the Congress delegates passed a rate increase, two increase. How much have we been paying for national dues? National dues, thirty-five. Thirty-five dollars. It's not going to be $15 increase. And how many of you have a national life membership? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. I bought one for my grandson. <laughs> and I also bought one for one of our, one of our members who is uh, my dentist. Dr. Finley. Now, Dr. Finley is 80 years old. He's a year younger than I. His life is not so expensive. So, if you're 80 years old, I can tell you that it would cost you $275 to get a life membership. My 18 year old grandson, 955. So, but. You can purchase a not life membership by August 1st. Now that's only what 10 days from now. Yeah. And I brought some forms here. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, because uh, you can see the handwriting on the wall. August 1st is the day. Well, what is your age? Uh, um, so I'm 76, and I'm going to be 77 on August the 9th. By well, the way, 76, you can purchase a life membership, national life membership for 325. And then the same thing for the other eye. Well, and, and, and I presume, well, I don't know what's going to happen on the uh, state level, but on the state tax, the state dues are not going to increase. And I don't really don't know what the deal is there. They, at first, all this was going to take place effective today. Uh, the Congress was over. They, we left and got them to push it off to. And but we can do this the one without the other. So, yeah, so you okay. can bet, you you can bet there's been a run on the bank up there. Right. Uh, lots of people. Lots. So I have some forms here. Shows the age. Shows your what. Mel Oller has to sign as the state secretary. Um, okay. That you're eligible for a life membership, and you can you can get a life membership at the national level, even though you don't have a, a life membership on. The local level, uh, as long as you say current, you still have to pay your due, right? Yeah, but you got to go to the national first for you. Can... Well, well, like this, too. and this is it. So, this is the farm. I'm going, to, I've got about 10 of them here. Don't take one unless you really are serious about doing it. But if you are serious about it, you've got about 10 days to do it. Mel Oliver has got the sign and uh. If you're 100 years old, there is no. This year for a guy, right? But if you're age one, if you're age one, it's a thousand and forty. So, yeah. But we know one thing is it's been several years since there has been an increase. I mean, like at least probably 10 years. And so, uh, in spite of what they're saying in Washington, inflation has. Bit us in behind uh, as well. So, um, Nathan, yes, in that motion, did they say what they were going to use the additional revenue for is it operations? It is operations. Uh, you know, we had uh, we've been running a deficit, but we've had a we've had a lot of flow, so we 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 still stay in business. And then we, of course, we got some of the government PPI money that uh, 
that made a significant boost in our total revenue uh, a couple of years ago and then we went nuts over COVID and so forth and and so uh, but but we it is for operation now there well it is for operation any other questions about it we had uh there were about it, it was a very large Congress. There were probably uh, five, 560 to 700 people there. And um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a good time. Any other questions? Okay. So everybody's on notice. Okay. Got an opportunity for 10 days. <laughs> so we got to get it signed. You got to get it checked on it. But if you'll get it to mail. Well, Yes, it, it, it's close for you, but if you can get it to mail, if, if you're going to act on the accident and uh, Mel's going to be well aware that people are going to be able to play. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't want to risk that if there's any potential members. You need to get their application to a meeting. Yeah, I think there is a. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think it's in water. So we really need. Uh, in fact, what was it? Richard's not Rich here. Is not Richard's here. not here. Uh, Dr. Finley's son yes. got an application and uh, I've got a it's pending uh, his, I guess, Richard's uh, approval and so forth. But uh, yeah, we, we really need to move on those two. Absolutely. Right. Thank you, Judge. Uh, and thank you, Stephen, also for a wonderful presentation. Um, do we have any other announcements or old business? Yes, sir, John. I was at the VA last week. The things are beginning to get back to normal, but we didn't have to wear that situation everywhere else. I got a new summer needs list. I'll get the get the family down to the uh, members uh, there. Working on building a new facility in Atlanta. Uh, it's, it's not that today, it's going so fast that uh, they now have nine facilities. And it's, so we used to be number two in the nation, and we're hoping to be number one in the nation now. Of course, the government and the veterans are going to be taking care of it. How many of you have played golf? Yeah, you may go. I need some golf balls. <laughs> <laughs> the very the difference. I've got the golf. You don't play it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you got some golf balls ready to me. And they, believe it or not, they mentioned about the number, I think the number of veterans in Florida. They said it was number two, guess who's number one? Everybody guessed active, you guessed it, and so forth. So yeah. they, they realized they were running second with Texas on the list. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. I just want to remind you everybody in connection with the judge said the 29th of July, Saturday, is the summer of DOM. Everybody is invited to join. I recommend it. If you want to stay current on what's going on, it's like 10 bucks. Go online, it's a Zoom meeting, so you can send the number to the very own home here and ask and do whatever you need to do. Uh, get registered and attend that meeting. Yeah. Yes, so uh, uh, reiterating, it's July the 29th. So yeah. be on the Saturday. Be a Zoom, but you have to register first. Yeah, the register, we'll send you the link and all the times. Right. Yes, sir. And on the back. Of, go ahead. Tom. Yes, on the back of the uh, program, Tom's got the the uh, online registration. How uh, you get to it on the website. And then when you register, it'll have the times. We're great on that. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And additionally, October the twentieth through the twenty second is the fall board of managers meeting. That's in College State. I'm correct. Yep. Uh, um, and then the annual conference is in San Antonio this year. It's April the 11th through the 14th. I say this year, it's 2024, so this upcoming April. All right. Um, any additional old business? Now, yeah, yes, sir. I just wanted to let everybody know I'm, I'm a member of the Fort Collins County 
Genealogical Society. We meet at Hewlin, you know, library in McKinney, downtown McKinney, in the last Thursday of every month. So if anybody wants to attend, um, it, it's a great group dedicated to becoming a better genealogist. And this past month, our featured speaker was Tom, who came in and um, talked about the use of DNA in the proof of his uh, Patriot ancestor, which was a great presentation. And it's kind of nice that we've got some cross pollination between these two groups. So you can come on Thursday and try it out. And if you like it, you can join us. Yes, last Thursday of each month, so the 27th this month, at Hewlin Library in downtown McKinney. At, at what what time? Uh, six, 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 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. One of the things, I got an interesting email uh, message today. I was going to contact your father about this. Somebody, somebody is interested in a minor league baseball team in McKinney and building a stadium for that purpose. <laughs> and the, the in, inquiry was. What would be an appropriate mascot for based on historical uh, McKinney historical things? I mean, you know we've got the McKinney Lions, you know how that came about. That's a high school mascot. But what would be an appropriate historically correct perhaps name or mascot for a minor league baseball team? And McKinney. That's surveyor. The Nathan Whites. <laughs> the Nathan Whites. No, that's a good thing about that. That's funny. That's uh, but anyway, think about that. If you have a, if you have a, another thought, surveyor. Uh, I'll contact the person who contacted me to say, hey, we talked about this. Had some, had some feedback and some suggestions. I mean, perhaps wonderful. Thanks, Judge. Anybody else? Announcements? Old business? Great. Um, okay. Uh, any, I know we talked about a little bit of upcoming business. Any other, any additional new business? Anyone? All right. Um, the minutes have been posted to the website. Hopefully, everybody's had an opportunity to review those. Um, at this time, do we have any any motion to approve the minutes? Yes, sir. Make that motion to approve. Motion by Tom. Any, any second? Yes, sir. we have multiple seconds. In the back. Great. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Any and opposed? Any opposed? <laughs> Hearing none. Hearing. The uh, uh, yes, motion uh, passes. Next, uh, Peter for the treasure. All right, so this July 20th, and there's been no activities on the right balance remains $7,432.40. Uh, last month, we briefly touched on the tunnels to towers to uh, uh, discuss whether we might possibly want to make a contribution to that. The executive committee uh, discussed that in our Zoom meeting recently. Uh, what tunnels for towers does? It's a, a foundation. And they build homes for heroes, whether they are first responders who uh, died, such as uh, firemen or policemen or military uh, personnel that have, that have died. So far, they built 250 homes or paid off homes for uh, uh, heroes. They've also uh, started, it, it, if there is a first responder or a military personnel that's been critically injured, they've started. Uh, having special homes or adaptations to homes so that that person can function in their own home. Um, and we discussed that in the exec uh, committee. Uh, one of the things that, uh, or a second uh, part of looking at this particular group is that uh, approximately 93 to 95% of every dollar that comes in is spent for the mission. 
which we think that's uh, very important as well. So um, the executive committee asked me to bring this again to the floor here. Uh, and I asked if anyone has a motion uh, for us to donate $250 per year to this particular group. Yes, Peter. Any seconds? I'll second. Uh, multiple seconds, Peter. And um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Hearing none. The motion passes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think it's a, a wonderful, uh, worthwhile cause, and it's definitely right up our alley as far as uh, what we like to promote. Do we have any other uh, items? Any other business, any other announcements, anything else that anyone wants to raise? Uh, it was a wonderful program. Again, uh, thanks for the program tonight. Um, and Donald Babs uh, usually is here via Zoom, but again, he cannot be here. So this time, the benediction on me, please stand up. Stand up. Stand up. May the blessings of God Almighty rest upon us and all our works done here in his name. May we give, may he give us the light to guide us, the courage to support us, the love to unite us now and forevermore. In Son's name. Amen. And again, don't forget if you want to uh, look at this live membership, take a few minutes and look at that. And if you're serious about doing it, uh, Now's the time to do that. So please join me in the recessional till we meet again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.